James Hansen is the chief climatologist for the United States government. He's the head of the Goddard, uh, NASA Goddard Space Institute. He threw us another curve in Brussels because we were hoping to tell the world mitigate at 450 parts carbon per million and maybe we'll only go up two degrees. Then James Hansen and his team went down under the oceans and they looked at the core samples from the geological record and they said to Brussels, you've got the figures wrong. You're wrong. If you mitigate at 450 parts carbon per million, remember we haven't even seen 250 parts per million until the industrial age, his numbers show we go up, and listen to this, every parent in this room and every would-be young person is going to be a parent, we go up six degrees Celsius in this century, and this is a quote from our chief climatologist, Jim Hansen, the end of human civilization as we've come to know it. I hope he's wrong. I really do hope they're all wrong. I look at all the younger people here, you'll be here to see this. This is a singular moment in our history. If they're right, and I suspect they're underestimating the speed, we may be determining the fate of our species in the next three to five decades. That's why all of you are here. You're the front line. You're trying to inform the world and move the world quickly. To do that, we're going to need a few things. First, we're going to need a new economic game plan, a new economic vision that can move quickly into practice. None of that's at Copenhagen. Two, we're going to need a new story for the human race, a new narrative that gets us to global consciousness quick enough to put the new plan in place. Three, everyone's going to have to be on the same page for five generations. Daunting task. We need a new economic game plan that might be powerful enough to address the enormity of this triple threat. The global economic meltdown, Second Industrial Revolution in life support, traditional energy sunsetting. Global peak globalization at 147 a barrel, the energy crisis, and the real-time impacts now of climate change on agriculture and infrastructure. What do we do? First, we ask this question. When do the great economic revolutions in history occur? We need a new one, correct? This is what all your sessions have been about in the last two days. The first thing to ask in the first session is, how do the great economic revolutions occur in history? They occur when two things happen. First, we humans change the way we organize energy on the Earth, and we have frequently changed our energy regimes. That's number one. Secondly, equally important, we change the way we communicate to manage the new energy revolutions. It is when communication revolutions converge with energy revolutions. When they come together, those are the pivotal points in history. They change the human equation for long periods of time. They change gestalt, as the Germans say. They change temporal spatial footprint. They actually change consciousness and the wiring of the brain. Communication energy revolutions. That's the changes in history. I'll give you an example. Some of you are fortunate to study cultural anthropology at the university. You read about the Sumerians in Mesopotamia. Why do we care about them? They launched civilization in ancient Iraq. They did it by capturing the sun the energy of the sun in photosynthesis. And the stored grain, barley and wheat, that stored sunlight in the grain was stored energy like fossil fuels. They created the first great hydraulic agricultural civilizations. It was complicated. Before that time, people lived in small pastoral and horticultural units of a couple of hundred people in a village. All of a sudden, they had to indenture thousands of men to build those canals. Think of the logistics of this. That was the first machine, the mega human machine, as Lewis Mumford would say. Then they had to create craft skills to build the, the dikes and the mechanics of a hydraulic system. They had to set up the royal granaries, the royal roads, and the distribution system for civilization. They had to create urban life. It required a communication revolution to manage the new energy regime for hydraulic agriculture. And they invented cuneiform writing. And what is so interesting is everywhere we had these great hydraulic civilizations, invented in the Middle East, the Indus Valley of India, the Yangtze in China, and even Mexico. Independently, humans come up with some form of writing to manage hydraulic agriculture. That's amazing. 10,000-year multiplier effect, the agricultural age, and consciousness went from mythological to theological, and from animism to monotheism. Changed the world. Stay with me, 19th century. 
another convergence of communication and energy. The print press had been around since Gutenberg. The Chinese and Koreans actually had it even earlier. But it didn't have an economic mission for several centuries. It certainly had a social mission, as you know, up here in the Netherlands. Uh, for Martin Luther, the print press was like the blogosphere for the young activist today. He started mass producing those Bibles in vernacular. And he said to his fellow Christians, you, you stand alone with your God, you, your Bible, the Lord, you don't need the Vatican or the priesthood. There was a Protestant Reformation. There was a counter-reformation. There was a 30-year war and a piece of Westphalia. That was all social. The economic impact of the print press didn't become clear until James Watt patented the steam engine and we went to coal and steam power. In 1820s, they introduced steam technology into print. It was no longer hand done. They put in rotary and linotype presses. They could mass produce print really cheap. Then around the same time, between 1830 and 1880, in the United States and Europe, we introduced public schools, mass literacy. We created a generation that was print literate so they could be the workforce to manage coal, steam, and rail, communication, and energy. First Industrial Revolution. It would have been impossible to organize the complexity of coal, steam, and rail with codex in the monastery longhand. 20th century, another convergence of communication energy, the second industrial revolution. First generation communication electricity, the telegraph, more importantly, the telephone, became the management tool, and cinema, then radio and TV, the marketing communication tools to manage oil, the internal combustion engine, the interstates, suburban rollout, travel and tourism, the second industrial age. Those energies are sunsetting. The technology and infrastructure based on them are in life support this afternoon. We are on the cusp of a third industrial revolution. And in these parallel sessions, you have been going through all the elements of it for the last two days. What I want to do now is structure it in one comprehensive story for a new infrastructure. Although if we don't look at it as a comprehensive story, you and I are going to be in pilot programs to the earth burns to the end of the game. You understand what I'm saying. What I'm going to lay out to you now is a four pillar infrastructure for third industrial revolution. We are on the verge of a new connection, convergence between communication and energy, which could give us a new revolution to get us to a post carbon era. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I think we can do it. We had a powerful communication revolution in the last 15 years personal computer and the internet, and satellite wireless and Wi-Fi connection. What is so interesting about this second generation electricity communication, it's different than the first generation that I grew up on. That was centralized, top down. The new communication electricity, everyone here under 40, is open source. It's flat. It's peer-to-peer. -peer, it's global. Any one of you can take a $100 device in your hand, create your own video, audio, and text, stored and digital, and then shared peer-to-peer -to, -peer to two billion people at the speed of light with more power than the BBC. And if we could do that in 15 years, tell me we won't be able to do the following and create a third industrial revolution. Here's what's happening. The key word I want you to take back to your cities that may get us through to a post-carbon era is this word. Distributed, distributed, distributed. The second generation communication electricity, it's not centralized. It's distributed. Think file sharing. We used to call it cheating. File sharing, YouTube, Wikipedia, Linux, Google, distributed communication. This distributed ICT revolution, we've been grafting onto a second industrial revolution infrastructure based on centralized energy so we never got its full productivity because it's basically a distributed communication form. So what I want to suggest to you is that this distributed communication revolution is now converging with a new energy regime, distributed energy. And when distributed information and communication organizes distributed energy, we have a powerful third industrial revolution that starts in our great cities, moves out to our regions, and then captures the attention of the world. 